night, folks, and welcome to Redneck Gamers Season 3. Personally, I think Shasta and I have hit a bit of a milestone. I can't begin to tell you folks how the beginning years of my critiquing were pretty rough, but now, due to your guys' support, I feel far more confident in my work. Now, because it's been three years since I've started reviewing stuff here on YouTube, I figure, why not start this season off on a good foot? So today, by popular demand, we're going to be taking a look at Super Mario Bros. 3. He is, actually. titles, and I'm very happy that I get to talk about it now. I'm fairly sure that you folks want to know how this game was made, so let's take that age-old dive into gaming history. Development on Mario 3 began immediately after Mario The Lost Levels was released. Miyamoto, Tezuka, Nakago, and Kondo, who were the dream team behind the previous Mario games, were all on board to make this new title, but what they were planning to create was big bigger than any Mario game that they had ever worked on before, so they needed help. Fortunately, they got it in the form of 10 additional programmers. Originally, Miyamoto considered using an isometric point of view for the game, but many playtesters found that this perspective made it far more difficult to place jumps correctly, so the isometric idea was scrapped in favor of using the former side-scrolling perspective. Hey, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. I can totally understand what Miyamoto was going for, but it's best he kept Mario 3 in its original perspective. The game took roughly two years to fully develop. One of the tools that the devs used to help them with visual animation was a graphics machine called the Character Generator Computer Aided Design. This tool generated a plethora of graphical shapes that would then be assigned numbers so that Mario 3's code could access them and then combine them to form complete images in real time. This helped immensely as what would have taken four years to make was cut in half. The game's cartridge itself also used a distinct chip to take full advantage of the NES's performance. In other words, Mario 3 was an NES game equivalent to a souped-up Ford V8 Mustang. Miyamoto and the rest of the devs wanted to show that the NES console was one powerful 8-bit son of a bitch that was capable of delivering something jaw-dropping, for its time anyway. However, there were a couple roadblocks in the way. 1988 was when the game had officially completed its development, but there was a problem in the form of a chip shortage. The demand for chips back in 1988 was quite high, but the supply was quite short, meaning that the game's release had to be pushed back until the chip famine was over. Another issue that Mario 3, as well as Nintendo, were up against was Sega. As I mentioned before in my review of Mario 2, Sega was gaining as a noteworthy competitor and alternative to Nintendo, and they were about ready to launch their 16-bit masterpiece, the Genesis. Now, for any other game, this would spell trouble, but Nintendo was very flexible. What other companies might have considered a threat, Nintendo saw an opportunity. And as Lady Luck would have it, Nintendo was offered a deal by Universal to have Nintendo's products featured heavily in an upcoming film called The Wizard. I promise you folks that I will one day review this awesome movie, but until then, let me just give y'all a bit of a backstory be behind this movie and its connection to Mario 3. Nintendo licensed some of their products to be featured in The Wizard, and one of those products was, you guessed it, Mario 3, in one of the biggest reveals in video game history. This proved to work in Nintendo's favor as the movie was successful, and thus word was able to spread quickly that a new Mario game was about ready to hit the shelves. Finally, on February the 12th, 1990, Super Mario Bros. 3 was released. This game reached legendary status after being put on shelves, and it's still counted as the number one favorite among many Mario fans today. And as you'll see, it's quite deserving of that. Up 
Unlike the last Mario games that we've seen on this show, Mario 3 starts up with a cute little movie that shows Mario and Luigi playing around on the title screen. I don't know what it is about this intro, but it's really charming. Maybe it's because it speaks to the inner kid in me. It kind of harkens back to those carefree days of awe and wonderment that I had as a boy. Anyway, Mario 3 has one of the best narratives in the main series of Mario titles. Oh, um, spoiler warning. The plot is as follows. Two years have passed since the events of Mario 2, that's Mario 2 USA, not Mario 2 The Lost Levels, and the Mushroom Kingdom has enjoyed relative peace since then. However, Bowser has had more than enough time to recuperate from his last defeat in Lost Levels and has amassed a new army even bigger than before. What's more is that Bowser has adopted seven children called the Koopalings, whom are just as evil as Bowser, by the way, and he's placed them all in rank as generals of his Koopa Troop. After rallying his commanders and army together, Bowser rolls them out to not the Mushroom Kingdom, but rather the entire Mushroom World. After invading all the lands in the Mushroom World, the Koopalings steal each of the seven lands king's magical scepters and start to wreak havoc. Mario and Luigi, under orders from Princess Peach herself, begin their mission to stop the Koopalings and return the scepters to their rightful owners. Along the way, Peach ends up getting kidnapped by Bowser, and the Mario brothers make haste as they head for his hideout in Darkland. There, Mario and Luigi face their greatest challenge, but through skill and sheer willpower, the Mario brothers defeat Bowser again and restore peace. Now isn't that a great plot? It not only follows up from the previous games, but it also goes beyond the boundaries of just the Mushroom Kingdom. And what's really awesome about this story is that it goes into depth with itself just a bit more than what was given before. It's like an evolution. The narratives become better with each game. time to dig into the meat of this review and go over some features. For instance, the gameplay is in my opinion the best out of the four NES Mario games. As I mentioned before, Miyamoto and his team decided to go back to what worked in Mario 1, so the game plays similar to that. However, Mario's movements in this game aren't as stiff as they were before. His actions are a lot more fluid this time around, meaning that deaths aren't as cheap as they were in the previous games. In other words, Mario 3 has the best handling in the NES line of Mario titles. And to me, that makes the game more fun to play. Controls can sometimes make or break a game experience, and whilst the other three Mario games don't have bad controls, they're still a bit more rigid than what's given here. But besides better game handling, Mario 3 has many other features that, in my opinion, makes it the best in the NES series. One feature that was introduced to the franchise is the map. More specifically, differently themed maps. You start your adventure out in Grassland, which is your typical Mario fare in terms of levels. This area is pretty easy, which is good because Mario 3 gets pretty challenging further down the road. The next map you go to is Desertland, and as its name suggests, everything is desert themed. This area isn't really hard, but it is slightly more difficult than Grassland. Coming up next, we get Waterland. Most of the levels here are set in or around water, so the best way to tackle this particular area is to use the Fire Flower power-up. Coming up fourthly is my favorite area, Giant Land. Now, some reviewers out there have always wondered why Giant Land is so loved amongst many of the fans. Well, a lot of it has to do with the enemies being bigger than their normal size. That kind of thing hadn't been seen before, at least not in a Mario game, and it showed that the NES was quite capable of handling that kind of stuff. Not to mention the fact that the levels are just downright fun to play through. Moving on to number 5, we're introduced to Skyland. Hey, 
Remember all those pitfalls that were in Mario 1 and Lost Levels? Well, the devs kind of decided to make an entire area based off that. Patience pays off here, so it's best to take it a bit more slowly because of the amount of pitfalls everywhere. Though, in saying that, I should mention that these pitfall levels are nowhere near as difficult as the ones featured in Lost Levels, or even Mario 1 for that matter. Moving on to area number 6, we get Iceland. The only thing you need to know about this place is that there's ice physics everywhere, meaning that Mario will have bad traction here. It's kind of annoying, but I actually tend to like a lot of the levels in this land. Maybe it's from playing as Luigi in Lost Levels in Super Mario 2 for so long. The seventh area is called Pipe Land. I reckon the devs were aiming to pay homage to the original, original Mario Brothers game with this place in mind. That and... Mario is a plumber, after all, so why not have an entire area based on his side job? The eighth and final area that Mario gets to venture through is Dark Land. When AVGN mentioned this place in his review of this game, he referred to it as Hell. And you know what? Yeah, that's exactly what Dark Land is. And I don't mean that in terms of how it looks, no, no. I mean it in terms of the difficulty that you'll face. It makes sense though, this is Bowser's home turf, so he's gonna throw everything he's got at you. However, there is a pretty sizable ray of hope on Mario's end. By the time you reach Land 8, your skills should be good enough to get you through it without too much trouble. Oh, you're still gonna lose a few lives and power-ups, but other than that, you should come through somewhat decent. It all has to do with how Mario 3 presents its challenge. Which leads me to my next topic. Remember how Super Mario 1 and 2's difficulty came in increments? Well, Mario 3 does that too, only it's done by which number land you're on. Say you're in Waterland, for instance. That means that the difficulty in the levels there will be greater than the levels in the previous area. To me, this is a fantastic way for a game's challenge to progress. Also, the difficulty is very fair. I never feel slighted, or at least not that much, when playing this game. Then there are the aforementioned themes that these areas go with, which are really cool. Both the land theme and the land difficulty features work very well. In fact, they work so well that they've been reused for future Mario titles. Mario 3 is where it all began, and I'm hella happy that Nintendo kept it going. They may not seem so spectacular by today's standards, but back in 1990, these assets were something to behold. Anyway, following in game sequel tradition, Mario 3 has some new baddies for you to fight. We see a return of some familiar faces, such as the Goombas and Koopas. Hell, we even see some reimaginings of these guys, including the stupid-ass Hammer Brothers. But we also get a completely new lineup of enemies to fight. Some of these guys were good enough to make reappearances and follow up Mario games. One of the new enemies are the Boos, ghost enemies that will actually chase after you as long as you're not looking at them. Here's a fun fact, Miyamoto got the inspiration for these guys from Takeshi Tezuka's wife. Apparently in, in real life, she's a pretty shy woman, but has a bit of a temper. Insulting or complimentary? You be the judge. The next enemy that we get to see in this game are the Chain Chomps. Here's another fun fact. When Miyamoto was a kid, he had an unfortunate run-in with what was apparently a mean dog. According to Miyamoto, the dog tried to run up to him and bite, but couldn't get that close to him because he was chained up. And that's exactly what this enemy does. He lunges at Mario, but can never really get to him because, well, he's chained up. Don't know why Miyamoto decided to make him look so cute, though. If it were I basing an enemy NPC off of a bad childhood memory, I wouldn't go for the cutesy look. Another enemy that we'll look at are the Thwomps. Have you ever watched any of those old cartoons that show a character dropping an anvil or something else heavy on another character's head? Well, that's what the Thwomps are, only these guys are sentient. They sit and wait for you in particular areas of a level, and once you're directly below them, they try to crush you. You don't have to worry much about these guys, though. Just be mindful of where they're at and where you stand. 
Now with all these bad guys running around the mushroom world, there has to be a chain of command giving them orders. Correct. At the end of Seven of the Eight Worlds, there's a Koopaling waiting in an airship to face as a final boss. As I mentioned before, between the events of Lost Levels and this game, Bowser adopted seven kids and made them generals in his Koopa troop. The cool thing about these guys, besides the fact that they've reappeared in numerous Mario games to follow, is that they're all named and kinda based off famous people. The first Koopaling you fight is Larry Koopa. He's named after Larry King. The second Koopaling you meet is Morton Koopa, named after singer Morton Downey. The third Koopaling you face is Wendy O. Koopa, named after Wendy O. Williams. Yes, this Wendy O. Williams. That is pretty fucking sweet. The fourth Koopaling you come across is Iggy Koopa, named after the punk rock pioneer himself, Iggy Pop. Iggy's kind of weird for me because he doesn't remind me of Iggy Pop. In fact, he actually kind of reminds me of Flea from the band Red Hot Chili Peppers. Weird, right? Anyway, moving on to Koopa number five, we get Roy Koopa. Despite being named after famous rockabilly star Roy Orbison, Roy Koopa looks more like he'd fit in with an 80s new wave band. Next on the list of Koopalings, we're introduced to Lemmy Koopa, named after the dearly departed frontman of the band Motorhead, Lemmy Kilmister. Yep, he's named after God. And you know, he kinda does look like he'd be Lemmy, if Lemmy were to live in Mario's universe, that is. Finally, at Koopaling number 7, we get Ludwig von Koopa, named after the genius composer himself, Ludwig van Beethoven. I can tell just by the names of these guys, Miyamoto has a hella good taste in music. Why else would he have named the Koopalings after awesome musicians? There is one more boss that you'll actually be facing throughout most, if not all, of the game. On seven of the eight maps, you'll have to go through these levels known as fortresses. Think of the airships, but a little less hard to travel through. At the end of each fortress, you have to battle against Boom Boom and he's ridiculously easy. In fact, the Kooplings themselves are pretty easy too, now that I mention it. All you gotta do is jump on their heads three times and their history. The only real challenge that I got from any boss in this game was from Bowser, and that makes sense because he's the final boss. enemies and obstacles to get through, Mario needs some power-ups. All the power-ups from the previous games are here, of course. We get the usual Mushroom, Fire Flower, and Star power-ups, respectively, but we also get new power-ups to try out. The one that Mario will be using throughout most of the adventure is the Super Leaf, which turns Mario into Raccoon Mario, complete with ears and a tail. The Super Leaf gives Mario the ability to fly for a short amount of time, and he can whack enemies with his tail. There's another variant of the Super Leaf called the Tanuki Suit, and to those who don't know what Tanukis are, they're basically a Japanese species of raccoons. Anyway, the Tanuki Suit acts similarly to the Super Leaf, but it has one thing that the Super Leaf doesn't, and that's the power to turn Mario into a stone statue for a few seconds. He can't move at all when he's in this state, but he is invulnerable, which means you can bypass some of the harder foes that you'll come across. Another suit that Mario will inevitably find is the Frog Suit. Gotta admit, not a big fan of this particular power-up. Mario hops around everywhere, and I don't know why, but it feels like you don't have that much control over him when he's in this thing. Now, I'm well aware that the frog suit makes it easier for Mario to traverse in underwater levels, but when it comes to that, I prefer the Fire Flower, because at least with that power-up, I have some defense against the enemies there. The final power-up that I'd like to talk about is the legendary Almighty Hammer Suit. The Hammer Suit is, bar none, the best power-up you can get in Mario 3, possibly the best in the series. 
It works much like the fire flower, but about a hundred times more awesome. You can toss hammers at enemies, duck down to be completely immune to fire. Hell, your attack is good enough to even get rid of some of the sturdier enemies. But there's a catch. Since this is the best power-up you can attain, it's super rare to get. So if you do manage to get this power-up whilst playing the game, make sure to only use it under extreme circumstances. Mario 3 is one of those games that wants you to experience everything. The devs were very proud of this game, and because they wanted everyone to see it in its entirety, they decided to shower players with extra items and lives. When you reach the end of a level, you gotta hit this flashing box. Once you hit it, you're given a card, and each of the cards have a different face. There's a mushroom card, a flower card, and a star card. Getting three cards of any type will result in Mario receiving one extra life. However, if three cards with the same face are collected, you get multiple lives. Getting three mushroom cards will net you two extra lives, three flower cards will give you three extra lives, and getting three star cards will result in a reward of five extra lives. Believe it or not, getting the star card is not really all that hard. You just gotta make sure that Mario's running at top speed by the time you reach the flashing box. I've been able to obtain tons of extra lives doing this, and you should too. The game wants you to witness it in all its glory, so there really shouldn't be any incentive for you not to try to get as much lives as possible. Another way to gain some one-ups is to enter these spade panels on the map. You play a mini-game, kind of like a slot machine, where parts of a picture slide past on panels, and you have to line up three panels to make a complete picture of either a mushroom, a flower, or a star, and win some extra lives. It's not easy. In fact, I lose a lot in this mini-game. But hey, the fact that it's here is what's awesome to me. Another thing that Mario 3 loves to throw in your direction are extra items. There are two ways of which you can get additional stuff. One way, and the way that you'll mostly be using, is to go into one of these toad houses located on the map, and inside awaits Toad to give you an item. Looks like the little jerk ball is here to actually help you rather than say, Fuck y'all, Peach ain't here. You pick from one of these three boxes, but you can only choose one. It's always random, so you never know what you'll end up with. Another way to bag more goodies is to wait for one of these card panels to appear on the map. When you enter into these things, you play a little game of match the cards. Match up two cards that are alike and you get that item. The thing about the card panels is that they only show up once you've accumulated 80,000 points. But that's not really a problem considering the fact that this game is almost ludicrously generous with points. that's worth noting in Mario 3 are the visuals. Out of all the NES Mario games, Mario 3 has to be the one with the best graphics. Everything in this game looks magnificent. The devs wanted to make full use of the NES's hardware, and they achieved this by putting a certain chip into the cartridge. The chip that they used was an MMC3 chip. The MMC3 allowed for better sprite animation and for faster scrolling, meaning that everything looks more crisp than an average NES game would, and it plays a little faster too. The game is just eye candy, and that's not surprising because this was the last main Mario game released on the NES. Well folks, I think I've gone over enough of Mario 3's aspects, so I'm going to give it its final grade now. But before I do so, allow me to give some final thoughts.
I really love this game, and I don't mince words when I say that it's the best in the four main NES Mario titles. It's almost perfect, but there are a couple issues. One of the issues is kinda nitpicky on my end, but I feel the need to mention it. The auto-scrolling levels, whilst not bad, are a bit of a pain in the ass for me. It's one of my gaming pet peeves. I've never liked auto-scrolling levels in 2D platformers. However, the auto-scrolling stuff isn't used a whole bunch in Mario 3, save except for the airship, but I can understand that, so it's not a huge issue. I just don't really care for it. The only other drawback that I found in Mario 3, and this really is a drawback, is that if you're playing the game on the NES, there is absolutely no way for you to save your progress. Mario 3 is a pretty long game, and I really wish that Nintendo added a save feature to it. I mean, they did it from Zelda 1 and 2, why couldn't they have done it for this? So unless you're thinking of going the emulator route, be prepared to leave your NES on for a few days. Though, despite these two little problems, Mario 3 is still a phenomenal game. Not many people know this, but Mario 3 was Nintendo's swan song to the NES. Oh sure, they went on to make a few more games on the NES after this, but it was Mario 3 that was their greatest work ever done on the console. It holds the rank of the overall best number one game on the NES, according to Game Facts. And you know what? It's deserving of that accolade. Mario 3 left a hell of an impact on not only the generation of which it was released in, but also video gaming in general. It's still talked about to this day as one of the greatest games ever made in gaming history. People still revere this title for everything it had to offer. Hell, even Nintendo themselves used Mario 3 as a template for further 2D Mario installments. But do you want to know what's really awesome about this game? It's that it has a full 16-bit remaster on the Super Nintendo in Super Mario All-Stars, and this time, it has a save feature. Yes, thank you, Nintendo. But believe it or not, there's actually another remaster that's slightly better than this one, and that's the Game Boy Advance version, Super Mario Advance 4. This game has an even better save feature and voice acting. Plus, it's on the go. What could be better than that? So because Mario 3 went above and beyond its predecessors and left such an impact on both the gaming industry and the gaming culture, I've decided to award it my highest grade of A for awesome. This is truly the best Mario game on the NES. Now, as I promised to my very good friend Dylan Tomasi, he's here to give his views on Mario 3, which, according to him, is not only the best Mario game out there, but also his favorite. So, folks, here's Dylan Delaps Tomasi. Hello, everybody. This is Dylan Tomasi, or Delaps, and I'm doing a review for my good friend Redneck, Super Mario 3. Now, I don't think this is my first review on Redneck's channel about a Super Mario game, but I can tell you of all the Super Mario games that ever came out, this one is the best. Absolutely everything about it, from the, the, the colorful graphics, to the great controls, to the awesome characters, to the excellent music, everything about this game is perfect. You get a sweet, awesome game world to kind of move around in. I love that. I love when you go to the houses and you get to open up boxes or to try to solve puzzles to get certain items you get to use in-game. Honestly, this is incredible. But what makes this game probably the most enjoyable is the multiplayer, or playing with a friend or a family member. It is really fun. I have a lot of good memories of me and my brothers playing Super Mario or my friends playing Super Mario with me. I don't have very many people that play games with me anymore, at least not in person. Well, the game itself, it still holds up to this day. It's absolutely amazing. And yes, I'm not very good at playing it. As you can see, I die. Just like, look at it, look. Fuck! Come on, here it all hit you. Yeah. Come on! That, that was kind of close. Wow, you suck! What the hell? What the hell are you doing here? It's me, Mario! I don't 
give a shit. Even my cat's pissed off that you're here. What are you doing in my home? I'm here to laugh at you because you're so fucking gay at playing this game. At least I actually played this fucking game. You don't even play the games, you're controlled by other people. You're, you're a fucking glorified mascot, you're a joke. Fuck you! I am the best! If I play this, I'll get number one all of- Number one? Number one what? It doesn't work that way! You don't even know the physics or the mechanics of your own fucking game! You're a joke! Now, I'm truly sad. I'm about to cry. Why you make Mario cry? Why? Oh, hey man. I didn't mean to hurt your feelings. You just got me mad. You know, just calm down. I tricked you, you stupid fat fuck. Oh, you piece of shit. That's it. That's it. I give this game a 10 out of 10. It's epic. It's amazing. It's great. I got to deal with Mario, everybody. Sorry, redneck. I got to deal with this piece of shit. Thank you for letting me be on your channel and have a great day. Come here, you motherfucker. Hey, get away from me. Give me your fucking shit. Jeez, I hope he doesn't kill Mario. Oh, I'm back on. Well, there you go, folks. It's got a perfect score of 10 from Dylan and the highest grade that I can bestow upon it from me. In short, buy this game. It's a must play for everyone that considers themselves a gamer. It's that good. Hey Shasta, want to give your final thoughts? <laughs>